Hello and welcome again to our lecture course uh, Relativity in Cosmology. So we do cosmology and I uh, spend some time to uh, motivate I mean, the use of this metric for uh, the universe as a whole, at least as a first approximation, because in a first approximation we can assume the spatial part of the universe to be homogeneous and isotropic and uh, in addition having the expansion well, that gives you that part. In addition, the expansion uh, in time um, gives you the scale factor. And I have derived last time the friedman lemaitre equations for A, which are uh, ordinary differential equations from which, given an equation of state, you can derive um, the expansion law for the universe. Now, before we proceed with that and discuss um, details for the solutions of A of T, I um, have here inserted uh, a section on distance measures because this is a non-trivial issue. Yeah, we cannot just um, put a ruler, I mean, to measure distances to galaxies, so we have to devise some uh, indirect methods of how to define actually distances. And this is important for observations, and uh, this is why I um, explain this to you in detail. So um, the observations, I mean, they don't give you distances. They give you um, the redshift. This is rather easily uh, measured. And also the energy flux of a source. Hmm? So we have um, a relation between redshift z. and energy flux of that source. This is what you can measure. Um, the astronomers using, I mean, historically motivated units, they'd also talk here about uh, of apparent magnitudes. This is what you know from astronomy. I mean, already from the stars, we have these apparent magnitudes, which have these uh, classes I mean, historically from one to six. Now, um, we had above uh, this heuristically, this Hubble law, C times Z is D times H naught. And uh, for example, if you are interested in determining Hubble's constant H naught, of course, we have to know the distance. So what is this? I mean, this is what I will discuss here in that section. Let us first have a look at the situation in flat space, because the formula from flat space will then be taken as a motivation for the definition in the curved space. So if I go to flat space, then I have the following relation. I explain what this means. So small l is capital L over 4 pi d squared. Now, what are these quantities? L the capital L is the luminosity of the source, yeah, which uh, we do not typically know. Uh, so this is the source luminosity, and it's measured in egg per second. I mean, the astronomers use these um, um, Gaussian units. You can also measure it, of course, in, in watt, if you like. Yeah, so, I mean, I just to remind you, I mean, one egg is 10 to the minus 7 joule, and the corresponding number holds for the watt, which is then um, egg per second or joule per second. Now, this d is in flat space just the, the Euclidean distance, the distance in flat space. And uh, this here is the observed flux. Now, this is what we can measure here. Observed energy flux, be it a star or, or a galaxy. And it has the units of uh, luminosity per area. Now, so that's the power that arrives and goes through, through um, an area of uh, one centimeter squared perpendicular to the direction. Now that's the observed energy flux. So um, if we took just this Hubble law, I mean, just for the time being, although we are in flat space, um, taking speed of light equal to one again, 
so if, if you have z is d times h naught, then of course from this you get, I mean, uh, you just substituting here the d from here, then you get here that L over capital L is H naught squared over 4 pi Z squared. Hmm? Now, so that in, in flat space then gives you uh, a relation between the observed energy flux and the source luminosity. Now, so that's a, a relation between redshift and brightness. Now, of course, this is easily measured. This is what we would like to know. The small l is also easily measured as well. The capital L, we ha must have some physical insight about the source. Yeah? So, for example, if it's a supernova, where we think that we understand the physical mechanism, then these supernovae always have some, some typical um, light curve from which we get um, the luminosity. No, so there is, of course, some input here. But independent of that, you see that gives, gives you a relation between uh, Z and observed quantities. Now, how do we generalize this to um, Friedman models? And I have uh, I referred in here, of course, to that Robertson-Walker metric. So let us assume we have here in, in time here our time T0 is where we observe and of course we observe light say from a galaxy which has a certain extension the light was emitted at an earlier time T1 now we are here and let us assume we are here in these coordinates at a coordinate value r equals zero so that's the observer V and here we have an extension say D of the source, I mean of the physical extension, which we do not know, I mean some light years, so parsecs, megaparsecs, and I have here this angle under which we see that, so oh, that's this angle, small delta, and okay, so this is here r equals zero, and this is here uh, located at r equal r1, or so at fixed r, yeah? we can adapt the coordinates to do that. So, um, so d is the transversal physical extension of a remote object and delta is the angular extension of the object. Now that's what we can measure astronomically. Now, um, there are basically three different distance measures that astronomers use. These are the so-called angular distance, the proper motion distance, and most importantly, the luminosity distance. So I give you the definition of all the three, and then I show you that they're in fact related. So if you know one of them, you, can, uh, you, you know also all of them. And I will then argue that the most important one is the luminosity distance. Okay, let us define then the following measures. So um, first, the angular distance, um, dA, is defined as d over delta. Hmm? Well, why? Well, for small delta, this would be just the ordinary distance um, in flat space. Now, if this were flat space and delta small, then it's, it's clear that this distance is delta times the, the, the real distance. Now, this extension is uh, um, delta times the real distance. And in general, of course, we don't know, and so it, we just define um, um, this as the angular distance. Then the second one is the so-called proper motion distance. Um, P and it's defined as uh, the trans. Well, this of course only applies if if this object moves. Mm -hmm. So uh, the transversal velocity uh, of that over the delta over um, the t naught. No? So why this? Well, I mean this 
corresponds, I mean, to the analog of what you know from the rigid rotation in flat space. I mean, when you when you use v as uh, omega times r. So um, this here uh, corresponds to the omega. So this is the apparent angular velocity. I mean, these these values are small, of course, astronomically. So this moves a little bit. And then you can uh, say that, okay, this velocity, which of course you don't know, um, is related to this times um, this, what you know, what you can measure, this angular velocity. Now the third is the luminosity distance. And it's defined as a dl by this is equal to squared of l over 4 pi l. And you see this is directly motivated um, by the flat space expression. Uh, if you have here the, the Euclidean distance here is the square root over L, capital L over small l times 4 pi. Uh, so in, in flat space, that's the typical, that's the, the real distance. Now in um, the Friedman universe, we take this as a definition. Now, and it's clear luminosity distance because this is what you infer um, from luminosities, no? the small l which is uh, observed and the capital L, well, you must have some insight into the physics of that. Um, yeah. So, before I focus on this here, I will first show you that these three measures are in fact connected with each, with each other. Actually, there are some, some relations that contain the redshift um, and uh, relate these. So, one, two, three are connected. And uh, so, let us start here from this Robertson Walker metric. And if we set here t equals t1, then of course this is constant, and r equals r1, then this is also constant, so that we only have that term. And we can adapt, I mean, the angular coordinates such that, I mean, in this direction, we have just one angle delta. Say theta is um, pi over two, and uh, the azimuthal angle is taken to be uh, delta. So um, then we have here that d, the distance, is then a of t1 times of the fixed r, which is here r1, times the angle delta. That's what you directly get from here. And uh, this is, I mean, from, from one, if you introduce the angular distance, is um, dA times delta. So that you get from this that dA is A of T1 times R1. So let me call this the formula star. OK, the infinitesimal version is um, d delta is a of t1 times e1 times d delta. So, I mean, I want to bring in here also then the proper motion distance. So, a v orthogonal, okay, is d, t, d over d t1. That's how it is defined. And uh, so, from this then, okay, it's clear d, d is uh, that's uh, trivial, and uh, so we, we, we can relate the dt1 to dt0. Um, we had this um, in 1242 when I discussed the cosmic cosmological redshift from the light propagation. Um, so we have here v orthogonal times d t0. So it's just this given by this um, ratio of the corresponding scale factors. No? I hope you recall this from 12.4. So we have the, d, the uh, physical distance given by that, and now we want to um, use the proper time distance to dp, which is uh, v orthogonal over d delta over d t naught, is then, um, if, you, if you take this expression here, you get um, a naught 
times R1. Now that's what, what remains. And then if you use here this, you get dA times uh, A0 over A of T1. Now we recall that, I mean, this uh, important central kinematic formula that the ratio of scale factors at different times is just given by the redshift. So here that's a 1 plus Z. So that we get here that this is dA times 1 plus Z. No? And so you see we have here now the first connection. We have the connection between the first two distance measures and the proper um, motion distance um, is uh, the angular distance multiplied by 1 plus z. And uh, actually a similar relation now will come out um, connecting this with dl. Now let us have a look at dl. So dl um, is given by this expression. Now um, let us investigate, I mean, the observed energy flux, a small l. Now, um, how can we relate this to the um, luminosity? Well, the object emits in, in, in the time dt1, which is the earlier time, the energy capital L times dt1. No? So L times dt1 is the first expression. So object emits uh, the energy um, L dt1 in time dt1. Okay, but this is ener energy is now redshifted uh, by the fact factor uh, a of t1 over a0, no? by the ratio of the scale factors, because you recall um, that we have for radiation an additional redshift factor. So we multiply this by a of t1 over a0, no? so, and this energy so, so this energy here, this one is redshifted by that factor, but it's also uh, then distributed over the whole area that corresponds, of course, to the distance between the objects. So we have here, this is 1 over 4 pi r1 squared a0 squared. Now here, we have here, <coughs> we, and this is a constant, we are at our position, so we have here the whole ang ang uh, spherical angle for pi r1 uh, times a0. And um, okay, so that's um, the energy, but we have also um, um, the lumina, I mean, the energy per unit time, per unit area. So we have here to um, divide this by uh, dt naught, where this corresponds to our time. No? So that's the incoming energy per surface, no? per surface. And so the incoming flux is that we have to energy per time, which corresponds to our time here. Um, now, again, let us uh, relate the, 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 the time intervals um, with the help of the scale factor. So, I mean, we have here, again, dt1 over dt0 is a of t1 over a0. So, then we get here, this is l over 4 pi, just re rearrange a uh, bit. A squared of uh, T1 over A0 to the 4 times R1 squared, so that you get from this that 4 pi L. I mean, that's what we have here under the square root is um, L times A squared of T1 over A0 to the 4 times R1 squared. So that, I mean, having this definition, we can then directly write down the dl from this. So we have here then 
and dl is defined as capital L over 4 pi small l. So using this here, we have a node squ squared r1 over a of t1. Now I, I want to relate it with the proper motion distance. So the uh, proper motion distance dp, which is written down here, dp is a naught times r1. So let me insert it here. So dp is a naught times r1. Then we have here dp times a naught over a times t1. And this is again our 1 plus z. So that we have here, this is dp times 1 plus z. And so we have also shown that the um, luminosity distance is related to the proper motion distance and because we have shown that the proper motion distance is related to the angular distance, all, the th all three are connected. So let me summarize then that we have shown then that dl is 1 plus z dp and then this is 1 plus z squared dA. Hmm. So why these three um, concepts when they are anyway related wouldn't you not just happy with, with just one well the point is this is motivated by observation so there are some classes of observation where you have more access say um, to uh, to the angles and others where you can measure say the proper motion so it may be that in in this situation you can measure property one and in another situation property two so um it's not that you always use from observations the same uh, measure. But once you have access to one of them, then you know uh, also the others. Uh, now we will, co we will uh, concentrate on this here. Yeah. So concentrate on, on, the lumi on the luminosity distance. And uh, so there are two things to say. So first, we may, and this is what we shall do now. Um, we derive uh, purely kinematically a relation between dl and z. In this way, we will make the Hubble law more precise and see also its limits because it, it only holds for small enough redshifts and small enough distances. Yeah? So this is purely kinematically. This means we do not use yet um, the friedman lemaitre equations for that um, or, or a particular solution. Um, this we will do actually later, in uh, actually in the next section, 12.7, um, when we have uh, solutions available directly, we can use them. But to do it here without those solutions, of course, has uh, advantages because you're independent of a particular model. Yeah, that's a purely kinematics. And uh, so let me do that first. So we have the following situation. So we have here, uh, say, the time t1 here and the time t0. So that's today. Well, just opposite to here, but we focus now on the light emission. So we have here the world line of the source, which is at r equals r1. And here, the world line of the observer at the r equals zero and we have light propagation from the source to the observer so here light is emitted and propagate reaches us here right and so that's here say gamma symbolizes this propagation now, so that's uh, what we have in mind and uh, so of course for radial light rays we have the s squared equals zero, this holds for all light rays and d omega equals zero. Okay, we just adapt the coordinates such that, um, I mean, this is the radial direction. So radial light rays. So um, then we get from this metric here, I mean, setting ds squared to zero and, and the omega squared to zero, you get then, I mean, the dt squared is equal to that. And uh, having to then the integration, so we have t1 to t0, dt 
over a of t is the integral from 0 to r1 dr over square root of 1 minus k r squared. Hmm? That's uh, what you get f using this from the Robertson-Walker metric. Now all we have to do is, I mean, of course, to, to handle this expression. So uh, we, let us assume that uh, all the quantities are small enough to justify a Taylor expansion. So assume that um, Z T0 minus T1 R1 are small enough. to uh, warrant a Taylor expansion. Yeah. That is, we um, expand A of T up to second order. Yeah. You cannot also do it to higher order, but that's for our purpose suffices. So it's A naught and have 1 plus H naught T. So now recall, I mean, the Hubble parameter is A dot over a evaluated today, so I write, um, I mean for short, a naught dot over a naught, hmm? and this cancels, so that's the first term, and the second, of course, you have a naught double dot, but we rewrite this in terms of the deceleration parameter that we introduced before, so we, we write minus one half q naught h naught squared t minus t naught squared, and so on. Hmm? Yeah. Recall that, I mean, this here is um, defined as minus a naught double dot a naught over a naught dot square. No? So if you take the definition of a h naught into account, you see this just gives the second um, order Taylor term. No? So we have here now two parameters, I mean, our h naught and also the change of the h naught, which is here the q naught. So these are the two free parameters here. Now we want to have um, a, a relation between z and these parameters. So um, let, let me then give you um, z is a naught over a of uh, t1 minus 1. That's the usual 1 plus z is the ratio of the a's. And uh, now I insert here, um, here this evaluated at t1 uh, here and uh, use again expansion of in some terms of small quantities. So this is um, the 1 over 1 plus h naught t1 minus t naught minus 1 half uh, q naught h naught squared uh, t1 minus squared and so on minus 1 and of course it's a geometric uh, series so you can write this as approximately h naught t naught uh, minus t1, so I have just written that in the opposite way, um, plus 1 plus q naught over 2 h naught squared t naught minus t1 squared, and so on. No? How do we solve that? Um, because these are small quantities, we solve it recursively. That is, we first write t naught minus t1 is uh, z over h naught, and this we insert then here in that. So we solve this recursively. So we have then t naught minus t1 is h naught minus 1. So z minus 1 plus q naught over 2 z squared, and so on. Now let me call this the formula double star. Now um, we had here um, before the relation between dl 
and uh, dp. Well, actually, that's that, that relation here. So we have here dl is 1 plus z dp. And the dp, you recall um, from here, is a naught times a1. So this is a. So this is, of course, what is needed. And, and this is where, where we now have to use uh, the star. So, um, so we have from star, we have then, OK, let me write it down again. So it's um, integral t1 to t0 uh, dt over a of t is integral dr over square root 1 minus k r squared from 0 to r1. Uh, now here, of course, we uh, substitute this relation here. So here that left-hand side, um, I think if you, I can just perhaps you allow myself um, to um, indicate that, that you insert it here. And the right-hand side, of course, you can solve exactly well it depends of course on the sign of k um, if uh, k is plus one you have the arcus sign if k is minus one you have the hyperbolic arcus sign um, or you can write it as formally one over this i mean if this is a negative k then of course you have imaginary numbers but you can write it in this form uh, so uh, the, and you get then the area function for k equals minus 1. Now uh, you can expand this, so this is roughly r1 plus 1 sixth r1 cube k. So now this term we can neglect here um, in this approximation. Of course, if you want to go to another, the higher approximation, you have to, to take this into account. But for us, this here is sufficient. So. Um, here. So um, what we then get here is, and uh, I just allow myself. Um, no, so we have arrived here from the from um, the propagation of the light radially from the source to us, d s squared zero equal, and the omega squared equal zero from the Robertson Walker metric. I mean, because then this is absent and uh, this is zero. It's clear then you have the two expressions here and integrated and I have shown you that, okay, this um, is approximately equal to R1 because the R1 cube is negligible here in this expansion and uh, expanding A of T, what we have done before, we insert this in, in um, at the left-hand side. So we have just to integrate this. Um, so we get here, I mean, the right-hand side is R1. And this then is, well, this is an easy integration here. Here over T, you have to integrate here and here. So we have here 1 over A0. And we have here T0 minus T1 plus 1 half h naught t naught minus t1 squared and so on which then from uh, for this formula 2 star above is 1 over h naught a naught and we have here z minus 1 half um, 1 plus q naught z squared and so on so um, from our expression for dl, we then know, I mean, we had above dl is 1 plus z r1 times a0. If you recall that, um, we can now directly insert the r1 here and uh, get that this is uh, 1 over h0, 1 plus z. And then we have z minus 1 half, 1 plus q naught, z squared, 
and so on, so that our final expression here is if we uh, multiply here the 1 plus z inside the brackets, then we get that dl is uh, h naught to the minus 1. And so the first term is the z. And if you collect the, the, the square terms, then we have here 1 half 1 minus q naught z squared and so on. Uh, so you see here that's now derived from the geometry and uh, you see the first term of this is the original Hubble's law uh, that the redshift is equal to distance times h naught. But now uh, you have, we have here a precise meaning of the distance. It's the luminosity distance. So this here, this part, does correspond to the original Hubble law, um, which was that is h naught times uh, d. Uh, and only in this limit can you interpret as a Doppler shift, you know, because then you have, to do, you have this z or c times z is the velocity, and uh, we can have a velocity then is um, h naught times d. Mm -hmm. You see here, then we have a, a, this is the first correction, and it's a correction that gives you, uh, that includes the acceleration or deceleration. Um, so it could, in principle, while, while you have here a red shift, it could, in principle, also give you a blue shift contribution, I mean, depending on the signs. Now, of course, Q naught is, uh, now we know it's negative, so definitely you have here a plus. But in principle, it could be, uh, you could have here something that is negative. Um, now for the um, observed flux, L, we can then write that the small l is capital L over 4 pi dL squared, which is a L, well, inserting this here and expanding L h naught squared over 4 pi z squared, and then we have here 1 plus q naught minus 1 z, and so on. Now, this is what we had before. This was the flat space relation. The flat space relation. So you again see you recover that for very, very small z. So if, if this is neglected, otherwise you get these corrections. Now you can use this to um, continue the expansion to higher orders in z. Um, so Matt Wisser, physicist Matt Wisser in 2004 has done that and presented expressions up to order z to the 4, um, which can be relevant for observations in principle. Of course, still, I mean, z must be smaller than 1, otherwise, I mean, these terms, these higher powers become bigger and bigger. Um, so let me mention this, so one can continue the expansion to higher orders in Z. So Visa in 2004 gave expressions up to order of Z the force, I mean two orders more than, than what we have here. Um, I, I only write down a CITES result up to order set Q because otherwise, I mean, there's no point and not very illuminating to write this down. But let me write it down for um, up to order set Q just to illustrate what kind of terms you have in addition, because then you get in addition to the second derivative, you get also third derivatives. No? So we have here then dl of z is z over h naught. So I put this outside, so this Hubble part, and then I have 1 plus uh, 1 half, 1 minus q naught z. That's 
what we already had. If we put a z outside, and he um, has then derived a new term minus one sixth, one minus q naught minus three q naught squared plus. There's a new parameter um, which I will explain. It has to do with the third derivatives uh, called j naught um, plus k. Well, that's the k from here. So this enters now at that order. And here, you see here, it has not yet entered. So this formula here is valid for all k. But here it enters. So we have here h naught squared, a naught squared no, times uh, z squared and then plus order z cube. I mean, it's up to order z cube because I have here one z outside. So inside the brackets, it, it's like that. Now and this uh, j naught here, yeah, maybe I allow myself to write this here so that it's uh, better visible here. So this is here defined as a one over a naught, and then you have the triple derivative, but it's made dimensionless, so it's multiplied here by this term, and it's called a chike. Now in German it's Ruck, chike in English, so um, that's, I mean, the na common name for the third derivative. Okay, so you see, and, and Visser has also given you the next um, the next term where you even have a fourth derivative. Now um, let me end this by uh, rewriting these results. In principle, we are done. I mean, that's what we wanted to derive. But let me rewrite them in terms of astronomical quantities. As I said, astronomers have this historically motivated. Uh, quantities like apparent and absolute magnutiness and uh, distance module. So if you read astronomical literature, you have to know this. So this is why I briefly um, is introduced them. So we in astronomy use instead of uh, L and capital L, the apparent and absolute magnutiness, the apparent and the uh, absolute magnutinis, magni two dines, a small m and capital M. So, okay, this may be unfortunate. This looks like masses, but it has, of course, nothing to do with masses. It's just historically um, the name for these for this, uh, um, brightness classes of the stars. So, and the definition is such that the capital L is uh, defined as a constant times 10 to the minus 2m over 5. Yeah. So uh, that would mean that m is uh, 4.72 minus 2.5. Well, approximately the numbers, the logarithm of L over L sun. Yeah, because the sun has m 4.72. I mean, <clears throat> that would mean that if the sun were at a distance of 10 parsecs, it would be a, a, a very faint star, which you could, could just see with the naked eye uh, of that um, uh, magnitude no, here. And the small l is then related to the small m. It's a constant times 10 to the minus 2m over 5. Yeah, these things are logarithmic because it had to do historically, of course, with the eye and with the logarithmic um, um, receptance of, of, of light, I mean, light uh, visi visibility for the eye, these logarithmic properties. And uh, so this is, uh, means an m1 minus m2 is minus 2.5 logarithm of 
L1, L1, L2. So the sun has a apparent magnitude, of course. The sun is very bright of minus 26.85 in this historic uh, logarithmic um, scheme, um, which where, where people had in ancient Greece divided up the stars, I mean, ordinary stars from one, the brightest, to six, the faintest. Um, and this is made quantitative here. No? So M, I should say M is the apparent, well, it's the absolute magnitude, you know, but it's the apparent magnitude uh, which I know the object in question, which the object would have at a distance of 10 parsecs, about 32 times point something light years. Um, so this would mean that, I mean, from the two, the DL, which is uh, L over 4 pi L, and we have the square root, can be written as 10 to the 1 plus M minus M over 5 parsec. That's just rewriting things in terms of uh, astronomical units. There's also then the so-called distance modulus. In German, it's Entfernungsmodul, distance modulus, which is the difference between the two. And uh, you get then from this, this is five times the logarithm of uh, DL measured in units of 10 parsec. So that you can also also write this as five times the logarithm of dl. Well, in cosmology, we prefer to use megaparsec. And then you have to add here, of course, I mean, this is 10 to the minus 5 megaparsec. And uh, this is why you get here in addition this 25. Um, now, let us add here, uh, insert here then our expression from above. I mean, which is uh, from below, which is uh, written here. And uh, so that's the final formula. So we can write for the distance module, then this from 25 minus 5 logarithm. If you, and then you have the parameter h naught measures in kilometers per second and megaparsec plus 5 logarithm and we have, okay, let us introduce speed of light c times z in terms of kilometer per second and then we have plus 2.5 over the logarithm of 10 times 1 minus q naught. That's of course uh, just numerically uh, roughly a bit more than 1. So in principle then you can measure um, from this formula the, the, the cosmological parameters h naught, the Hubble constant, and here the deceleration parameter. And if you are brave, you can do this to higher orders and also get the charge from it. Yeah. So, of course, the input is the redshift. This is observed. And the apparent magnitude, this is also observed. Okay. You have to have an idea about the absolute magnitude because you can only do um, apply this if you have an idea about the intrinsic brightness of those sources. Otherwise, I mean, this could be anything. You have to compare the intrinsic brightness with the apparent brightness. But uh, here, the physics enters. So physics. So need to know the physics of the source. Also, for example, supernovae of a certain type that you lose in cosmo supernovae type 1a, which have a belief to have, I mean, always the same light curve. So you can infer really the intrinsic brightness from this, understanding the physics, of course, of these uh, explosions. Um, okay, for very small z, you see only um, the Hubble 
constant enters. Uh, but if you only observe to very small z, you have other problems because this is very close and there the objects have uh, big peculiar velocities, their own proper motion, like Andromeda Nebula you cannot use for that because it's so close, it approaches us, it's uh, not subject to the cosmic expansion. Right? So, so it would be nice, of course, to have very, very small z, but that's also not possible, so you have to have um, to use this formula, small z, but large enough so that, that objects uh, expand. Okay, so far for the distance measures, um, that's important if you want to connect theory with observation. So next time we go uh, again to the differential equations that A obeys, the friedman lemaitre equations, and we will discuss various solutions for various cosmological models. So thank you, bye-bye for today, and until next time.